be recording. The very first one I did with you before it cut off my introduction. <laughs> so I would wait a few seconds. Okay. But here we go. So hello, folks. Welcome. I am Eric, and I still have not figured out how to introduce this show that I'm doing. So I will just say welcome to my favorite horror with author. Oh. Publisher, Whoa. podcaster, screenwriter, <laughs> movie producer, Max Booth the Third. Welcome, Max. You came prepared. I don't even have all that stuff. I did. Up. I don't know how well that that went. I didn't get like the things spread out. Oh enough. wow! Look at that. You have a book that no one else should be buying right now. That's awesome. <laughs> and I have that thanks to you. Oh yeah. And and I've got I only have these three issues right now, right now of Dark Moon Digest. Have you you know, I also struggle with how to begin my podcast sometimes. I never know like what to say in the beginning. I always at first I thought I could tell like a funny, spooky joke, but I quickly uh, <laughs> ran out of energy with that. Maybe you could do like 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 a like today's wisdom you can begin each episode with some wisdom to the audience. I feel like I would run out of that very quickly. <laughs> like, what is the best life advice you could offer somebody? Just do that every episode. Oh, uh, yeah, I'll give that some thought. Well, it's I also, you know, I'm I'm introducing you. Did you just mute your microphone so you could sip your coffee? <laughs> yes, I am a professional. The little, the little uh, yeah. thing came up that showed me your. Yep, there it is. Yeah, I know. I, I've, I've done this in the, in the before, man. I know what I'm doing. See, I just, I just grab my drink and <laughs> whatever. Um, but uh, I always think about the fact, you know, I'm, I'm introducing the guest, but right there in the title of the video, it says who it is. So I'm like. Yeah. I feel like I'm doing it like it's supposed to surprise people. Oh, look, this is who he's talking to. But yeah, if you looked at it, you know who I'm talking to. Yeah. Um, do you listen to Conan O'Brien's podcast? Conan I don't. His friend? So he always like leaves it up to like the suspenseful, suspenseful reveal of who the guest is. But it's in the title of the episode. Every <laughs> every podcast of any interview show advertises the name of the guest and the title usually but at least in the show notes so it's never a surprise it's not like someone is just listening to these randomly without looking at what they're clicking on everybody knows i'm on this show but it would be <laughs> strange if he just began without doing the intro so i don't know what like the middle ground is yeah i don't know and the podcasts i do listen to uh, some people do break the rule, and I'm not sure why it's a rule exactly, but, you know, it's always the, the guest can't speak until they've been introduced. So, and yeah. I feel bad. I mean, you're already on screen since this is a video thing. People can see you, but I still feel, okay, I need to introduce the guest. <laughs> I don't know if I could, if I had, if I would have the balls to make like a guest just be quiet as I was talking. That's why I just do my intro separately. But I mean, this is a video thing, so I don't know how much more complicated it would be to do editing. But like with the podcast, I just do the intro and the outro separately by myself. Well, uh, on my old computer, I had a, some editing software, mm -hmm. I guess it would be. And uh, for my book reviews, I actually had like an opening title and some music and I tried to get fancy. And then I, uh, my job started scheduling this like 55, 60 hours a week. And I actually stopped doing videos for a couple of years because I just did not have the time or energy. And when I came back to it, I went back to my original low budget. There's just no editing. So... And I, I may maybe start to add something to it, but I'm I just like this whole free form throwing it out there kind of thing. You know, you say low budget. What is the budget specifically? Technically, 
I guess it would be the cost of the books that I'm reviewing. Um, this piece of paper that I didn't pay for. Oh, nice. But I did buy the marker. Yeah. How much was that? With. What's that? How much was the thermalicol? 70 oh, cents? It was a pack of like four Sharpies. So what is that? Oh, nice. Three, four bucks? I don't know. Um, and then I suppose you could say the cost of a computer, but I would have had a computer anyway. Do you, uh, did you write off the cost of the computer with like taxes? Because this is technically like a job. Well, since I've never made a cent from it, I don't know if you can do that. I write everything off on taxes. <laughs> I write off like one room of the house because it's a space we use to conduct business. And yeah. I'll have to consider that. This will be the tax tip episode. <laughs> I suppose back when I was being fancy, I used to actually draw out my ratings. Oh, wow. Um, for every single book, had a, I would pick some sort of, like, let's say, for we need to do something. Okay. It was never anything too complicated. So I may have picked, I, I may have drawn like a, an upturned, I, I don't know if this would be considered a spoiler. An upturned wastebasket with like a rattlesnake tail sticking out. That would have been cool. And I would I would uh, outline five of them because it was an out of five system. Yeah. And then say I gave it four and a half out of five, I would fill in in color four and a half and have that half outline. That's um, navigation. Wow. It was just, it just, became, I have a couple uh, art spiral bound sketch pads filled you should with. ebay them off and uh uh but it again it was just too time consuming i was working way too much at the stupid day job um so i don't do that anymore yeah and i actually have there's one author who um said she would love to have the picture i did for her first book and i was going to send it to her and i cannot find it <sighs> Because before I bought the little, the art pads, yeah. I was just using computer paper. Right. And I told her I would send it to her and I can't find it. It might still be around here. I doubt that I would have thrown them away. And then you just recreate it and just pull 10 I like that. I could, but that seems like cheating. No one's going to know it. <laughs> I was uh, at a Q&A last night at a film fest and um, one of the audience questions was, you say this movie's low budget, but what was the budget? And I <laughs> I just looked at them and I said, 80 bucks. And <laughs> that was a lie. <laughs> um, I always, I, I'm never sure if there's a difference between like low budget and independent. And if there's another category. Um <laughs> because Hollywood low budget is a hell of a lot different than independent low budget. Yeah. And then you have, uh, you know, Mike Lombardo. Mm -hmm. Do you, is he just a low budget filmmaker? He's an independent oh. filmmaker. I mean, the same, the same stuff is, uh, confused with like the book scene because sometimes, if you self-publish, you will called an indie writer. And if you go through any other means of publishing, you will a, main, a mainstream writer. But that's not true. I mean, those mainstream writers, those indie writers who, go, who get published by, like, indie presses, and then those self, self-published writers, which maybe should just be considered an indie writer. I don't think, like, indie and self-published should be interchangeable all the time. But I do see, well, only self-published writers are considered indie, and I, I, that doesn't seem right to me at all. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. See, now, I never think about that as far as books go, because when I'm reviewing a book, it doesn't matter where it came from. I'm just I'm reviewing how well it's written, what the you know, all of that. Whereas with a movie, uh, and I very rarely do movie reviews, but you know, I, it's essentially warning the viewer if I say you know this is a low budget independent film, so they know it's not going to be 
high quality or I shouldn't say high quality, you know, CGI and and yeah. all of this stuff. Um, because I mean, just again, looking at my book cart, I can see mainstream publishers. I can see some self-published stuff, small press. Um, but it's for me, it's well for uh, books or movies. It's it's the content. That's yeah, I, I guess the biggest difference between movies and books when it comes to this is the budget isn't going to change the quality of the story itself. With the mainstream press, the the budget is great on like how the book is printed, but it's not going to change the text. The right. text remains the same no matter what. Compared to a movie, well, sometimes you have to make sacrifices to the story itself because of money reasons. Exactly. Um, and I would go as far as marketing as well for books. Yes, that is a really good point. It definitely makes a difference. One day I would like to get a publicist, <laughs> fill the company. Maybe one day soon. I don't know. <laughs> Wait, should I have added publicist to your list as I was introducing you? I mean, I don't want to <laughs> call myself a publicist because I would, I'm a really bad publicist. I'm not great at promoting things, and but I'm the, the, all we have at the moment. But one day soon, I will hopefully have a little money to get someone to help me do that. Well, come on. Now that you're a big Hollywood guy. I am one month away from applying to a new job. <laughs> no, no, no. That is so oh, no, indeed. <laughs> that is sad. Well, I'll tell you, my sister lasted six months as an overnight hotel person. <laughs> what happened? Um, I think she got yelled at <laughs> by I a customer who decided to leave. Um, <laughs> but she may have, it may have been she didn't like the hours. Yeah. Or found something uh, that was better, but... Um, she does not do well at all with people uh, yelling at her or reprimanding her. And yeah. I do know it was shortly after she told me a customer was screaming at her that she no longer worked there. So I used to be able to handle it OK, but I think it happened too much and something in my brain broke. But also I've gone almost... Yeah, I've, I've gone over 12 months now without having a, a mainstream job. And I don't think I can go back. I don't think I could <laughs> I could let some asshole manager like boss me around. I I think I've I've gone beyond that now and I think I'm doomed to, to a bad fate in my life if I if I don't sell something soon. <laughs> well, um you you had your Q&A last night. I did. And did we mention, did you mention what that was for? The Q&A? Yeah. So it, there's a, it was there's a local film fest in San Antonio called F-I-L-D-I Film Fest. And that stands for Fuck It, Let's Do It. It was nice. the second, uh, the second one, the second edition of the fest ran by, it's run by a guy named Justin Rodriguez. He's a local filmmaker. And uh, him and I have, like, exchanged emails a few times over the pandemic, and he just reached out and asked me to come do a Q&A. Uh, the movie I wrote wasn't at the, the film fest. It was a film fest for, like, uh, like short films, five- to ten-minute films. So I just drove down, and I was like, they had some movies, they had a band play, and then they had me do a Q&A, <laughs> and that was it. It was a small, like... 20 maybe 50 people were in attendance it was fun a little ground little show q a was good i had fun um i'm still not used to like being on a stage with a bright light shining in my face because i'm i want to look at the audience but i'm also being blinded so i have to get used to that i've done lots of like stage stuff in the past but usually without a bright light on my face okay um and again, have we mentioned the film that you wrote? I can't remember. I we we can. I, I wrote a film called We Need to Do Something. It's out now. You can rent it. You can buy it. Uh, yeah, that's the book it's based on. Of the book? You, ha you should have a new edition coming your way soon. We, uh, we mailed them out two days ago. 
Yep, I got the shipping uh, okay. notice, and I should have a third eventually. Yes. And this this is the one that's not signed. Oh my! So at some point, did I, I not have... sign it, or did you get it someplace else? It, it was before I knew any better, and I ordered from Amazon. Oh boy. Uh, so I have to find you at a convention somewhere sometime and get you to, to sign this one so I can have all three of my copies signed. Um, yeah, when I, f- uh, I, w- I was introduced to you through Brian Keene's podcast. Oh, okay. Yeah. And immediately just went to Amazon and ordered, we need to do something and touch the night. Sweet. Well, I'm uh, glad that did something. So both of those... No. A podcast being productive. That's awesome. <laughs> Both of those I got from Amazon and then then went to PMMP, and, which, there we go. We can pro- promote that a little bit. Um, so now I always order from PMMP. Um, what, a, what a great logo. I have... I. The first thing I did after I put my book cart together was throw all my stickers on it. Yeah. So I've got a couple PMMPs, a ghoulish, which for some reason, Betty Rocksteady had to comment on the the picture. She said it was really a really good picture there. Yeah. I don't know why she felt the need to mention that. (laughs) Give me two seconds. I got to let my dog out. He's going crazy. Hi, Frank. Okay. All right. See, now that was half the reason I wanted you on the show. So I was hoping Frank would join us. Oh, man. Well, if he comes up to me after I let him back in, I will bring him up. <laughs> I love the Frank pictures that you post. He's a, he's a funny dog. I haven't been able to get a lot done lately because if I – usually if I'm sitting at this desk for too long, he, he freaks out. So – Mostly right. just hanging out with a dog. All right. Well, let's uh, let's dive into, I guess, the the main part of this. Okay. I asked you to pick one of your favorite horror movies or books to talk about, and you yes. picked. Let's see Phantasm. if you remember what you picked. Phantasm. We're talking about oh, Phantasm. Wasn't, wasn't right? Phantasm. I hope not, because I didn't watch that. Oh no. Well, look at that. Physical media. Isn't that great? People Dead 2, 25th wow. anniversary edition. Nice. I don't own any of those movies on physical media. How sad is that? It's I'm my still, favorite franchise. <clears throat> excuse me. I'm still a physical media kind of guy. I, I love the special features. Yeah. I, like I have a lot of in. movies on DVD and Blu-ray. I just I don't have that one. Uh, so... Evil Dead 2, uh, why, well, no, first of all, if there's anybody watching this who doesn't know it, can you give us a synopsis of the movie? Yeah, uh, a ladies' man who looks at a, a spilling shop, he takes his uh, lady friend, Linda, to a cabin in the woods, which is basically, okay, so this got off to an awkward beginning, <laughs> a while in the past, this guy Ash and his pals went to a cabin, and everybody but him died a brutal death, and then he escaped. And then sometime later, he took his lady friend, also named Linda. So in the first movie, she was named Linda, and this one, she's also named Linda. He thinks, we need to have a, a getaway, so let's go back to that cabin. All my friends died, and we won't talk about them. So they go to this cabin. And they play an audiobook of the Necronomicon. I think I said that right. And yes. <laughs> evil things will summoned. And Ash, Ashley Williams, I think is his name, has to fight off demons once again. And he seems surprised, despite the fact that it happened already in the past. Ashley J. Williams, yes. What do you, what's the J stand, Phil? Um, you know, I probably have heard it before, but I don't recall at the moment. I feel like it's something like Joan or Julian or something weird. It's Joe. It's Joanna. 
<laughs> Joanna, Ashley What's Joanna that? Williams. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. Now. Yes. I watched. I, I watched this. Rewatched this this morning, yeah. and I was watching some of the special features. Now, in the special features, they say, well, one, they couldn't reuse any footage from the first movie. Yeah. Um. But two. I forget who it was. Somebody said Ash dies at the end of the first one. Does he? So that this is essentially a reboot. I don't remember. I don't. I'm I'm struggling to remember how the the original one ends. I know it has that awesome like clayma- claymation melting scene of the bodies on the ground, but I thought he lived. Well, he he walks he walks out of the cabin. Yeah. And then it has the camera shooting through the woods, shooting through the camera, shoots through the front door. He turns around and it, you know, like slams it to him or it ends? It's, it's a black. I, I fucking hate movies that end abruptly. I'll tell you that. <laughs> if you can't, if you can't come to a natural ending of a story, you're just a piece of shit. Why leave it up for speculation to the audience? That's no fun. I don't want to use my brain when I watch something. <laughs> Especially not something like this. <laughs> uh, shout out to the critics of We Need to Do Something. Anyway. <laughs> oh, those sons of bitches. <laughs> yeah. <they're... laughs> it's funny. I was just thinking um, about that for some reason uh, with music. Yeah. Because uh, I've been listening to a lot of Spotify and stuff at work. And I was like. You know, when a song just fades out, that's just the freaking band not being able to come up with an ending to their song. Yeah. <laughs> just give me, I want that ending to my song, not just, we're going to repeat the same, wait a minute, that doesn't sound good talking to you. I was going to say repeating the same thing over and over and over <laughs> again and fading away. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I wish different. I wish someone made We Need to Do Something into a, a rock opera. That'd be pretty cool. Well, there you go. Yeah. I was, I was, I'm going to bring up, well, I guess I'll mention it now, but a little later, I do want to talk about Evil Dead the musical. Oh, yeah, I forgot that happened. I don't know anything about <laughs> it. So if you know stuff, I would love to, to hear about that. I had seen it. We must definitely talk about it. Yeah, we <laughs> um, need to talk about this first. Yeah. What was the... Uh, okay. So... I guess with an ending like that, it doesn't definitely say he dies. So we can we can assume based off of the second movie that he lives, even if it's mostly pretty much a reboot of the film's movie, despite the fact that it has that two at the end. Uh, well, we could maybe he got hit in the head and had brain damage. Yeah, and so didn't even realize he was going back to the same cabin. Yeah, and plus, also, the end of this movie implies time travel is real, so it's really possible he got sucked back in time. Well, something like that. He just has no, like you say, memory of what happened. Could be. It's also possible uh, they didn't think about it and decided who gives a shit. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Well, I was going to say there's also there's kind of a time frame problem if we think of it as a sequel, because uh, when... um, Man, I just watched, and I can't think of uh, the character's name, the daughter of the... What's that? I said Ash. (laughs) His name's Ash. Different character. The daughter of the cabin's owner, um, who's coming back with the pages from the Book of the Dead. Annie. Annie. um, She says, according to them, her father was there and alive a week ago at the cabin. Is it possible that he was in the cabin in the original movie and they just did not notice? <laughs> he was just in the corner somewhere. <laughs> um, do you know how Stephen King's involved in this movie? Because he is greatly involved in this movie. Are we talking about the second one or the second, the second one? Not specifically. The only Stephen King connection I know is that I used to. I had a subscription to Twilight Zone magazine. Yeah. And I read his review of the original movie. Yeah. And then I actually saw it, saw the original at the drive-in, not realizing it was that movie. Oh, nice. Until certain scenes, because there were photos in the in the article in Twilight Zone magazine, 
I was like, holy shit, this is the movie Stephen King was talking about like a year ago. That's awesome. Um, so that's so, yeah. all I. That's, that I'm going to be greatly paraphrasing and taking some liberty with the facts. I don't have it in front of me and I'm not going to bring it up. But yeah, that review made the original movie be pretty famous, actually. I mean, it's because of his review that people went and saw it. But so Sam Raimi and uh, his Peltonilds, they wanted to make a second movie. And the second movie was going to be Ilmy of Darkness. It was going to take place back into the past but they couldn't get a budget fill it they had a guy who they wanted to finance it but they were having trouble convincing him and then i believe sam raimi had dinner with stephen king and he they mentioned how like we can't get this guy to finance it so right there at that table stephen king called the uh finance heel because they also knew each other and stephen king said hey you should invest in this movie and he did so if he kisses Stephen King, this movie got the budget. The only uh, downside was the uh, person who was financing it, they didn't want that specific movie. They wanted a movie with a similar setting and ba- uh, premise, which is why they ended up writing the second movie the way it is, instead of doing Elmi uh, Delkness. Right. Well, they one, that's fantastic. Yeah. Stephen King got that done. And two, we did eventually get Army of Darkness. We did. Which um, one do you uh, um, like, Mill? Which one first, do you like, Mill? Yeah. The original is my favorite. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, I think it's a great horror movie. I love yeah. low budget stuff where you can kind of see the, the, the chinks in the armor. Yeah. Um, and, and it's, I don't know, I tend to have a soft spot for originals. Um, like I'm a, I prefer Terminator to Terminator Two. That's a good I, movie, man. Most people that I know, most people I've ever heard talk about it are like, no, Terminator Two, that's the one. I'm like, no, Terminator, man, that's, I love that freaking movie. And yeah. uh, so, I, as much as I love all of the Evil Dead movies, the first one will always be my true love. Yeah. Um, but the and <laughs> my only real, excuse me anecdote for evil dead 2 i was out in california so when i was in the service and a buddy and i rented the movie i was like oh yeah i didn't even know it was out to rent at that point i was like i love the first one we gotta rent evil dead 2 so we uh rented the vhs and went back to the dorm and we're watching it and the this is the first and perhaps only time where I've had to stop and rewind a movie because we were laughing so hard, we missed about five minutes of the movie. And that's when the eyeball flies across the room. Yes. <laughs> we lost it. That move, this movie, I mean, if anything, is a good example of how amazing bruce campbell is that physical comedy i mean it's also a different reality path line but he just was like a a little stooge i mean he's so good at physical comedy it's so fun just to watch him throw himself around and make a make an idiot out of himself well that scene when he's fighting his own hand is just incredible it is i i i used to have this movie on dvd i know that because i know i've seen like um, behind the scenes footage and outtakes of him smashing those plates over his head. And I don't think this is true, but maybe you know. Well, those plates real plates? Because I kind of think they might have been. That can't be true. I don't see. I don't remember anyone actually mentioning that in the in the special features. Every, they just kept talking about the flip that he did. That was the thing that seemed to impress everybody, and the fact that he was doing all of this himself. Yeah. I mean, have you ever, I mean, maybe you have, I don't know. Have you ever, like, been alone in the house and, like, you just tried to fight yourself? It has to be difficult to make it look entertaining. I mean, it's just him. There's no one else. It's just him pretending his hand is possessed. He's trying to fight his own hand. That's amazing. I have not tried to fight myself, but I have 
like done weird hand acting for a lack of a better term to see like what if my hand was possessed what would it do can i like control the rest of me so it seems as if my hand is a separate entity because i'm weird yeah. like that <laughs> can you so how does it look uh i don't know the rest of my arm keeps moving with it <laughs> ah, all it happens yeah I, I do feel i'm like yeah i'm controlling it i'm I know what I'm doing. I sometimes uh, freak myself out by thinking about how my hands move or any of my limbs move because it's really much like a like somewhat telekinetic abilities, right? Because my brain thinks this the move. Then it does. It does what my brain says. And I, I promise I'm not high, even though it <laughs> sounds like it. But it, if I think too much about how underneath this flesh I have a skeleton – and it's just waiting one day to hatch. I just, I don't know. It, it's unsettling, <laughs> greatly unsettling. Well, see, I'll occasionally think about, like, what happens, because I'm not consciously thinking, okay, right arm, reach over here and pick up this book. Yeah. I'm not giving instructions like that. It's just, I know that that's what I want to do, and I do it. And I, I yeah. do sometimes, I mean, what happens if, just out of the blue, I try to reach over and pick up that book because I want to, and my arm just doesn't listen. That means you've died. Is that it? That's that's the <laughs> test? I don't know. Do you, um, this used to happen a lot when I was milking a night shift at the hotel because I would go a long time without sleeping, and I would kind of lose track of, like, who I was. And I would, sometimes I would find myself behind the front desk trying not to doze off, I would blink and open my eyes, and I would be in the lobby just pacing around. And I would think, how the fuck did my body move across the hotel and decide to do something else without me, like, thinking about it or concentrating on it? And I, I think maybe sometimes bodies have a, a mind of their own. Yeah, sometimes they just want to go out and do things. I don't know. So why why was this your pick? Yeah, or so I love that franchise to death. Uh, I'm going to talk about them as if the three movies were just one movie, because that's just how I think of them in my head. Sure. Um, growing up, I they um, they blow out before I was alive. Um, I was obsessed with uh, all three of them from a really young age, just due to the fact, I think, that my brothers liked those movies, and they would always have them on, so I grew to love them. The physical comedy I thought was great from a young age. I loved the special effects quite a bit, specifically at the end of the Phil's movie. I Nothing makes me happier than those claymation bodies melting. <laughs> I, yep. I had a special edition DVD of the Phil's movie. It might have been one and two, but it might have just been one. That was a book of the dead that was made of like level. I love that to death until my uh, nephew destroyed it. I'm still upset with him about that. And I don't know what specifically beyond that really spoke to me. I guess I mean it's, those movies will chaos. There's no rules or anything. There's no logic to them. Nothing is really too much explained. We get that there's a book of the dead, and that spooky things happen once you read it. And beyond that, anything goes. I mean, <laughs> there's no logic. Uh, a body, anybody could just be possessed randomly. But, like, then they could die? I don't know. Sometimes you can kill them, sometimes you can't. There's no weakness to them. Maybe it's just due to the fact that I watched them at such a young age and they were, like, the first movies that I uh, found myself attaching to. The second one, I I tend to like more than the rest of them. I think just laundrily due to the uh, the the possessed hand aspect of it. I love the physical comedy of him fighting in the kitchen. <laughs> I love how insane he looks when he cuts his own hand off, and then he has to fight that hand. I I love when he's sitting in the living room and just laughing. <laughs> Like yep. a maniac. It's, it's just it's such a good vibe. I love all of that so much. I mean, the Edel 2 movies and the remake and the TV show, I mean, all of them were just great. 
feel familial. They feel like they feel like home to me almost. What about no, you? I have, I have all three seasons of the show on Blu-ray, and I have not watched a single episode yet. Well, so good, like surprisingly <laughs> good. Um, well, like I said, I, I first heard about it from the Stephen King article in Twilight Zone magazine. I happened to see it at the drive-in because we used to just go to the drive-in to party. And didn't really care what was showing. But that movie started, and I'm like, all right, I'm done partying. I'm watching. Yeah. Um, and then rented Evil Dead 2. I saw Army of Darkness in the theater. That was a, I'm absolutely going to see this movie now that I, I'm part of it now. Yeah. Um, and now, do you look at any of the other media? There's, you know, there's comic books. Um, there's games. I have, I have not read any comic books. I should. I don't know why I haven't. I've I've played some of the games and I, I like them. I am sh- struggling to think of the names now, but I know there's one game where you will in a city, while like the the deadites will roaming the city, and that's a lot of fun. I think it's called like a fistful of boomstick, perhaps. I played. I don't know. I played one of the video games, and I can't remember. Which one it was, I just seem to remember there's a lot of time travel in it. I don't know if I played that one. And then I actually I have a card game for Army of Darkness. What's that what's that like? Um it's it's fun. It's pretty simple. You're uh you can be Ash, Sheila, Arthur, or is it Henry the Red? Yeah, yeah. Henry. And you can your your goal to win is have no monsters in front of you okay. and have the Necronomicon. But you can flip over to your evil side. <laughs> and if you flip over to ev- your evil side, then your goal changes. You want monsters in front of you, and you I think you still have to get the Necronomicon. That was something else I liked about the second movie was the uh, evil Ash. Mm-hmm. I I don't know what about that I liked at a young age. It just seemed cool to me that the protagonist could be possessed. Like that was like, oh shit, you don't do that in a movie. But they and did it. Looked it. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> and going to a uh, Army of Darkness, that eyeball in his uh, shoulder is one of the most disgusting things I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Even thinking about it now, it's like uh, it's kind of cringy. And I, I love how he just grows a head. That's really, really cool. Although I do think in retrospect, like revi- recent revisits, Elmia Darkness is probably a bit too campy for my own tastes. I love, I mean, I, if I had to rank them, I wouldn't. But <laughs> So I'm not going to. But I do think uh, Elmia Darkness is probably on the uh, lesser end quality-wise, even if I still think it's awesome. It, I think it has some iconic moments, but it does especially... Uh, the scene where he goes to get the Necronomicon um, does really get... That might be, the, I think, the campiest bit in the entire series. I um, So there's a, a, a section of that scene that I think is really funny that I still quote. is <laughs> That's when he can't remember the past build. And he just like... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's such a good gag to me. I, I love that all of it well the uh like there's the card game i had i used to have an army of darkness board game i think there's an evil dead 2 game board game that's out now Mm. or is coming out um and then with comic books there's been a ton of different uh evil dead or army of darkness series there were two freddy versus jason versus ash mini series well hold up those little comic books yes um, did you read them? I read the two, the Freddy versus Jason versus Ash ones. Can you explain the, the, the context of how that's going? What's going on in that? I'm struggling uh, to understand how they can even clash together. It was, boy, it was a long time ago, but I think at least the first one, I feel like it had started with sort of the same premise as the Freddy versus Jason movie where Freddy is using Jason. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it just happens to be in 
wherever S Mart and Ash are. <laughs> okay. So he just happens to get involved. And then the second one's a little more complex, but I don't remember. Or is maybe Freddy wants the Book of the Dead for some reason? Why? <laughs> I don't. It, it has been years and years since okay. I've read these. I don't even know if they're available to get yeah. new. You might have to find them on the, like, the um, secondary market at this right. point. Uh, but... In uh, there's Marvel Zombies, and the third or fourth storyline was Ash versus Marvel Zombies or Army of Darkness versus Marvel Zombies. That sounds fun. So you had Ash and the yeah. Marvel characters, which had uh, a zombie. Was he a zombie? Howard the Duck, <laughs> which was <laughs> great. Um, and then now, uh, Dynamite Comics uh -huh. has a lot of um. IPs, they do Red Sonia, Vampirella, they do uh, Army of Darkness stuff, and they have a series now called Dynamite, D I E, yeah, exclamation point, Namite, and they're on the second mini series of that, and they introduced Ash into that. I want to write an Evil Dead comic book, god damn it, that sounds amazing. Send your always, to dynamite. I always forget comic books extend beyond just like I'm a Spider Man through web. Evil Dead, that's amazing. I'd say mm, at least half, if not more, of the monthly comics I get are independent mm -hmm. or smaller, you know, not DC and Marvel. Yeah. I and began reading one. Before. I began reading a good one recently. Um, it's called The House on the Lake. The Great House yep. on... Do you know what I'm talking about? Absolutely. It's pretty, it's pretty I'm good. I'm reading it. Yeah. I'm well, not... Check... Go ahead. Oh, I was going to ask if you checked out the Joe Hill stuff. I have some of it. I uh, haven't finished it because I find it really difficult for my brain to follow along monthly to a comic book and then I just lose track. Yeah, so I, need, I need to, I guess, maybe wait them out and get like the collections of once they're done. Maybe that's the way my I need to get those. I don't know. I just I just got volume one or just the the collection of uh, Daniel Krause's new comic book, um, The Autumn, The Autumnal. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> uh, not off the top of my head. Oh, I love video shows because I can just run away. <laughs> Look at that Frank. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So uh, maybe that, I'll read uh, it. Is that from Vault? It looked like the Vault logo on the back. How do you tell? <laughs> yes, it is. I I get a few things from that from from Vault, and I just recognized it when you turned it really quick. <laughs> um. Well, the, the Joe Hill, the Hill House comics from D.C., there's a new one coming out that's written by Rio Yours. Oh, nice. Which was, and it's it's called Refrigerator Full of Heads, so I don't know if it's a continuation of, I assume, but I'm not sure that it's a continuation of Basket Full of Heads. Maybe it's Joe a Hill continuation wrote. of uh, Eight Heads in a Duffel Bag, which was a Joe Pesci movie. Yes. <laughs> Could be. Maybe. Well, it would be, well, I guess Basket Full of Heads would have been the continuation of Eight Heads in a Duffel Bag, and then now the Refrigerator yeah. Full of Heads. Was, was it a continuation? I haven't read it. No, Is not Joe at all. Pesci in that comic? Oh, yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Have you seen that movie? Um, if I have, it's been so long, I do not remember. So, it's been, I was maybe five when I watched it, but I loved it when I was five. So, let me try to read I think Joe Pesci is a hitman, and he's been contracted to kill eight people and bring the, the several heads to the bus. And Joe Pesci is like, well, I guess I'll fly with these heads. And the, his bag gets uh, mixed up with someone else's head uh, bag. So mm -hmm. this other, the protagonist of the movie is just like a Joe Schmo type of guy who, who goes home with this bag, and it's just a bunch of heads. I hate so, when that happens. It's... It happens pretty frequently. 
That's why you got to put like something that stands out on your duffel bag. Yeah. You don't grab the wrong one. Like if you were traveling with heads, you should put heads in bag on yeah. this on the bag that's, so they know. That's what I was gonna say. <laughs> Just label it bag head. So head nothing bag. nothing seems more badass to me than having a chainsaw as a hand. And maybe that's why I love the second one so much. Yes. We do get I mean Possibly the most iconic moments from the series are in the second one. Yeah. I I definitely watched that one the most growing up. And I think probably because of, like, the cool scenes. Like, the, you have the chainsaw, you have the hand being cut off. I haven't revisited the original one as much, like, in recent yields. But I know I, know I loved it back when I used to watch all three of them obsessively. And now I kind of want to just revisit the original because the original is less campy, right? It's more like this is a fucking scaly movie. I don't think there's really any camp in it. Yeah. Um, except when the characters before all the you know the shit goes down, I think maybe Bruce Campbell acts a little goofy as a character. Yeah. But I think it's more straightforward horror. Well, this it was also written by someone else too, right? Because the original is written by Sam Raimi, but the second one is written, hold on, is written by Sam Raimi, but also by a guy named Spot Spiegel, S-P-I-E-G-E-L. And he's known for comedic stuff, so I assume it was just his presence adding that influence to it. Well, see, it, again, in the, the behind-the-scenes stuff that I was watching this morning, they talked about the the first draft and then him coming in and changing it and that the the money men the thing almost they didn't mention army of darkness but they did talk about you know let's do it more like this and change this so i read something at one point maybe they talked about this in the outtake and not the outtakes the behind the scenes how one of the original ideas for the second movie after they decided to set it back at a cabin, that they could have, like, a bunch of convicts break out of a prison and go to that cabin because, like, they have, like, money stashed still, and then they run into Ash and the Deadites. That would be pretty fucking cool, I think. That's interesting. I hadn't heard that one. Ah. Um, this, I, I try to, uh, in my, in my uh, book review videos, I try to throw out a question nowadays at the end of the video for people to answer in the comments and i just reviewed the unseen by brian smith okay which deals with a friday the 13th sequel that essentially it's from another dimension yeah it's like a real sequel that was made but just in another dimension so my question to the audience was um you know what sequel would you like to see and I always give my own answer, which for me was a 19, like 1992 produced sequel to Army of Darkness. But I want it to be a sequel to the alternate ending. Yes. So what was that? And he, he fucks up the potion, right? Right. He, he's counting. He's supposed to take like four drops or whatever yeah. it is. And he gets distracted and miscounts and takes an extra drop. What once he? I, I'm I'm struggling to remember what life is like when he wakes up. So please remind me. It just he he wakes up. He gets out of the cave and it's just a post apocalyptic wasteland. Okay, like we just see a so, skyline with all the buildings are half destroyed. Okay. I and, thought maybe it was like dinosaur stuff was going on, but I can't remember. So no, it's I not dinosaur stuff. I don't think we see anything but just destruction. Okay. Oh, um, so we don't know, you know, was there a comet? Was yeah. Did dinosaurs come back? Was it a zombie apocalypse? But, yeah, that was my answer to my own question was, I would love to see made back then, like as soon as they finished Army of Darkness, they made this sequel that follows that ending, seeing P Ash in a post-apocalyptic wasteland. That would have been great. 
Yeah, that, that's a great answer. Because you would also, I mean, he would still be the same age, so it would still seem like it just happened. And plus, you would still have that the the great like stop motion effects of the monsters moving around, which would not look as cool nowadays. I think they would just do some digital effects that make it look smooth. And I hate smooth things. I I'm not a fan of CGI in horror movies. Yeah. Just generally, I mean, I'm not saying it's always a failure. Yeah. But I like I like my horror movies to have a gritty. A grittier look to them. I mean, I just the 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 video ghoulish I had mentioned, which is about practical effects that's going to be coming out. I mean, I talked at great length with uh, Dan Rebuilt, who did the practical effects, and we need to do something about this. Everything we're talking about right now, and yeah, I mean, practical effects are so much better. I mean, for many reasons, and one of them is it's a physical presence. The cast isn't looking at like a green tennis ball. <laughs> the right. little acting around something. It, it benefits all of the movie. And even even when you're talking about something low budget like Evil Dead, Evil Dead 2, Army of Darkness, where you know it's the some of the stop motion, like the dancing headless Linda, yeah, can look a little silly, but that's the charm of the movie. I don't as a kid, that dancing was so scary, I thought. It, because of how unnatural she was moving, mm -hmm. I found that quite striking. And I think a similar thing with all stop motion and claymation, the way things move were just kind of frightening. <laughs> right, it's unnatural. Yeah. I wish I was stop motion. <laughs> um, so... I mentioned Evil Dead the musical. Please, yeah. And have you have you heard any of the music or? I know nothing about it. Um, I actually had the soundtrack. That was the my first introduction to it. I was just like, okay, this there's a musical. I got to check out the music. Bought the soundtrack. I love the songs to it, and um, I actually got a friend and I got to go see a performance, a local local ish performance yeah. performed in the woods which wow. was great wow um and it actually encompasses for the most part all three movies okay the first half is essentially the first movie yeah and then once ash is the last person left that's when annie and mary joe and jake and ed whoever the other guy is they show up yeah. And then at the very, very end, the only thing that's really from Army of Darkness is the the last scene where he's at the S Mart and the the Deadite shows up. Yeah. Um but it's a lot of fun, I thought, and the songs are catchy. And uh, we were they said for the one we went to, they were like the first four four rows will be a splash zone. <laughs> we were way in the back, and we still got covered. Oh, my God. Is that... I guess it's not in production right now. Nothing is. Right. Hey, fuck, I would love to see that live. I, I'm really interested. I'm going to look up the music when we're done doing this. Because I'm, I've gotten into musicals quite a bit recently. Uh, a book I'm writing right now, I'm convinced it would make a great musical as a film adaptation. So, like, I'm thinking of songs in my head already. My head already and I'm thinking, oh... Now I need to check out this Evil Dead musical to see any extra inspiration. <laughs> I can tell you right, the first song is just called Cabin in the Woods. It's a very upbeat, peppy song. Yeah. But there's also a song called What the Fuck Was That? <laughs> so That's how awesome. can you go wrong? Yeah. I'm excited to check that out. What do you uh what did you think of the reboot, the remake? I liked the, it. Yeah. I think it's one of the best remakes I've seen. <laughs> Um, I've only seen it once. I do own it. Yeah. Uh, but great cast, um, great directing, and it's definitely, I don't recall any camp at all in that one. I don't think so. I I used to own that on DVD, but I let a code local of the hotel borrow it, and she never gave it back. And now we don't, <laughs> we don't have the same job. So I guess I have to buy it again. Oh, oh I hate when that happens. Wow last time i let anyone borrow a movie something i loved about that one was how 
the 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 reason they they come up with for being stuck in the cabin. I mean, uh, this person is addicted to drugs and they can't leave because we're trying right. to withdraw. All right, uh, you're gonna have to excuse me. This is gonna be horrible. I have to get up and do something, okay. so first of all, I have to move that, and then I don't know if you want to vamp, show people your books. I'll be back in just a moment. Oh, no editing. <laughs> no, oh, there's no editing. Oh, hey, hello, me. I'm my name's Max. I uh, I wrote a spooky book. I I was I'm not prepared for this. If I can read you guys something. Uh, Fuck. I have a copy of a, a book I wrote called The Nightly Disease. Ah, look at that. Look at that. Isn't that pretty cool? Um, I'll read from a book I'm writing uh, right now. Um, it's called Maggot Screaming. Okay. Uh, I'll read it until he comes back. Maggot Screaming by Max Booth. And the plot is none of your goddamn business. It is dedicated to Robert, Diane, Melissa, and Bobby Crandall. This book would not exist without them. Thank you. Um, the cast, I'm not going to tell you. Yes, I do have a page that just says the cast. Um, I do have a spill it page where I write down things that I, I want to inspire the book. Like, this is the vibe I want. So I can read that to you. Um, in darkness, no, fuck me. Uh, darkness, light, darkness. Lawton live the new flesh. Rotten.com, the cipher, the lonesome crowded west. Dead man's bones, the feeling you get when your fingernails will dirty, and no matter how hell you scrub, they will never become clean. The fog that turns people inside out. Pinky's dream. All right, epigraph, what are we doing? <laughs> the epigraph that you don't need to know about this. Uh, the audience knows. The epigraph <laughs> is the pill sites all excited when you're dead, eyes bulging, entering your head, and all your thoughts, yeah, they rot. And that's from a ugly Casanova song called Pill Sites. Welcome back. All right. Well, thank you for that. You're not the only one with a dog, but I had to go <laughs> all the way downstairs and, and, uh, pick the dog's old i'd pick her up carry her outside all good i was uh dogs don't care about what you're doing they do not um, unless you have tasty food yeah then they get very excited at least when they see me with their little bacon bits or whatever they are <laughs> <laughs> um, excuse me all right so you're reading song lyrics is that what was going on i was, uh, I was reading the beginning of uh the book i'm writing maggots scream screaming and i was reading the epigraph and um i have a a page in the beginning of the manuscript where i've written um things i want to invoke the mood of the book so i was reading that page so like the the, the simpsons episode i'm sure you've seen it there's a fog that chills people inside out yes and i just i love that so i just wrote the fog that chills people inside out because i want to invoke the feeling that that episode gives me and i wrote um rotten.com which is a uh, website all children should look at and there's an <laughs> album i i really like called dead man's bones so i have that written down that's a album by ryan gosling <laughs> oh wow yeah, actually, I was listening it. I was listening to it today. Look at that! It's Ryan Gosling and like twenty children. They made a spooky album, and it's the best album of all time. I'll, I'll so. take your word for that. <laughs> Amazing. Um, yeah, I I've always said my favorite Simpsons episodes are well at this point early Treehouse of horror terror whatever they are yeah um they the the last few years they've sort of gotten away i think from the roots of what they were doing back in the beginning i agree yeah um well not as good mostly i think because they stopped doing like actual spooky movies like you would get like fucking hilly puddle uh yeah. the episodes like what why is this and this is not a treehouse of hill episode Right. I, yeah, loved those early ones. I still mentioned Lousy Smarch Winters. When, uh, 
with the we need to do something when we were doing uh trying to design the set the uh the production design well, amy williams she sent us like 12 different options for a bathroom and the one we ended up going with was called the shining because it's really much similar to how the shining bathroom looks but she she misspelled it as the shinning and i <laughs> laughed so fucking much and i would say shh don't want to get sued and no one else knew what i was talking about they just assumed like ah oh, it's just a typo but i i suspect even if it might not be true that she was doing a simpsons joke <laughs> <laughs> or at least subconsciously channeling yeah. the shinning <laughs> um have um so we've been talking about the re the, the the most recent remake which is great a great movie yes um any thoughts about the upcoming uh, evil dead rise um i'm excited about it yeah i don't really know anything at all about it I, nothing's been uh, announced yet i however know a few things about it which i can't talk about on the episode all right. Well, thanks for being a tease. We can talk about it after this is done. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm always looking forward to uh, to new, you know, Ashley J. Williams content. Even though, as I said, I have all three seasons of the show and well, have what not. What are you watched. waiting on? Um, I've met. I mention this a lot. Whenever I have a choice between reading and watching something, ninety percent of the time I pick reading. That's that's a good choice. So, yeah. I need to uh, I need to buckle down. Stop wanna... reading, geek. <laughs> oh, I actually just started a a book by this guy Stephen King. Have you heard of him? Yes, I have. What book is it? I haven't read those yet. I have not read these either. Um, but, and I picked them up because I read The Outsider. Yeah. And fell in love with a certain character who is in these books. Who's that? Uh, Holly, whatever her oh, name is. Is she in The Outsider? I guess she is, yeah. I have I have read that one. Okay. Yeah, that was my introduction to that character, and I knew she was in the, the Mr. Mercedes trilogy. I don't yeah. know if that's officially what it's considered, but I was like, yeah, I, I'm getting those books just for that character alone. Cool. I, but, uh, I have I have not read that trilogy yet. I have, I imagine one day I'm going to. I don't know. I, uh, what's that? Oh, all I said was I don't know. Oh. <laughs> I I grabbed it at this point because someone that I'm hoping to have on this show uh, suggested a movie we could talk about, or suggested Mr. Mercedes, and I was like, ooh, if I can read that fast enough, yeah, we can talk about that. Um, not that I would have a problem talking about it, not having read it. I just think it would be easier if I know what's going on. It would be a chaotic show if you could not read the book. Well, I would just, I would have him try to convince me why I should be reading it. Okay, that's a good point. That, that, would, be, that would be a good show. Convince me to read something you like, or well, you wrote, some, one of the two. Well, that's uh, Jared Barbie, who's in the first episode of this show, um, we went with the movie Pandorum. Okay. But when he was talking in books, he said, there's the Dark Tower trilogy. And I was like, I do not have time to read <laughs> the Dark Tower, or not trilogy, series. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> the Dark Tower series. I was like, I do not have time to read the Dark Tower series before we record. So let's go with Pandorum. I can take <laughs> two hours and watch that movie. Yeah. That is the best thing Stephen King has written, those seven books. People say that. I, I've i read The Gunslinger one and a half times. Yeah. Um, I read it when it first came out. I was very excited for it. Yeah. And I read it, and I was like, eh, whatever. I, it, it didn't do anything for me. And then when, like, the, the author's preferred edition or whatever the later yeah. edition was i was like well let me give that a try and i only made it halfway through you gotta I, get through because it it gets so much better after that one i think i think the gunslinger is pretty good but i do think it's difficult to get through maybe just because it's not what someone might be expecting the second book 
it's a it's a it's like a fucking crime drama. It's it takes place like in I think New York City. <laughs> you had like the mafia in it. It's insane. Is that the drawing of the three? Is that the second yeah. one? Yeah. Okay. Well, and it could have been my mood when I was reading it because as I, I don't know, I carry this as like a badge of honor now. I have said for decades that Pet Cemetery was the second most boring book I have ever read. Okay. And then I just reread it either earlier this year or late last year, and I loved it. Such I actually a good loved book. it. It it's was amazing. One of, it has one of its best endings of all time, I think. That is such a great ending. It was so fantastic. But for literally decades, I thought it was one of the most boring books I'd ever read. And I think I assume that's just I wasn't in the right place mentally for reading it at the time. I had something similar happen with Day of the Dead. I always, as a kid, I always thought that was such a bad movie. And it just it was so boring and just not interesting. Then I rewatched it like a year, maybe two years ago. It's my favorite of the the trilogy. Day of the Dead is amazing. It is, yeah. It's it's a great movie, and um, Bud, Bud or Bub, the zombie. Oh, it's Bub. He, I was amazed to find out there was an actor that I was aware of. He's in an episode of Seinfeld. He's always to me. He's, um, I believe, he played Lex Luthor on Superboy live action TV show. Michael and then Rick. I was just looking at his credits one day and it was like, holy shit, he's the zombie from Day of the Dead. Oh, wow. We should have did an episode on Day of the Dead. <laughs> uh, we could have, but I would have had to uh, find a copy of it somewhere because I do not have it. I own that one on Blu-ray. Yeah, so gr- you should look into it because there's a great, a lot of great, mm, there's a lot of great bonus features in that uh, disc. They have like a long behind the scenes video of like Sam, uh, Tom Savini doing all the special effects. It's so fun. I watched the, the behind the scenes stuff last year, deep in the COVID. Right after I finished making, uh, we need to do something, and like seeing um, uh, George Romero like on set hanging out with actors without a mask on was like mind blowing to me. Like no, like that's not, you're breaking so many safety protocols right now. Yeah, it's <laughs> weird how you get into a certain mindset and forget that you're looking at something from so long ago. Yeah, it's like wait, what do you do? You should be six feet apart. <laughs> Um, yeah, I would have to go get that one. I actually went to uh, the exchange yesterday and had to buy. I bought three movies for upcoming episodes of this series. Um, two I've seen before, but it's been so long that I want to yeah. rewatch them. One I have never seen. But which one's that? <laughs> I've never seen Terrifier. Neither have I. And a, a buddy of mine down in South America who's actually one of my oldest Internet friends. Yeah. I've known him like the longest since I've had the internet. Uh, that was his pick. Um, and I couldn't find it streaming. Huh. Uh, except on like IMDB TV. Whatever the fuck that is. <laughs> um, but then uh, Fright Night and the Burbs. Oh, yes. I picked up and I've seen, but I saw both of those in theaters. Yeah. But it's been so long. And then I actually, I picked up It Chapter 2 because I just haven't seen that yet. Uh-oh. Big mistake, Bill, <laughs> pal. <laughs> Picking it up. I know some people aren't happy with it. Have you seen it yet? No, I, I just got it yesterday. Oh, good. Don't. <laughs> Is it <laughs> Don't really do that it. bad? Yeah, it's, it's, it's so long and it's just bad the whole time. <laughs> oh, no. That's it's, 750 it's a, out the door. It's a waste of half a day. <laughs> Well, I will, t- I will tell you, uh, since The Outsider, I have made it a point to pick up every Stephen King book, the, at the very least the week that it comes out, if not the day. Yeah. Which isn't a lot of stuff, but The Outsider, Elevation, The Institute, um, the Hard Case one. Oh, I yes. Um, can't think of it. I'll, I'll tell you what it is later on. But... I have not yet, because of you, I have not yet picked up Billy Summers. Oh, no. <laughs> My bad, Stephen King. <laughs> I will. I will eventually get it and read it. 
Well, I mean, you might like it. Um, did you love the outsider? I did. I liked the outsider did a lot. Did you like the end of it? Um, I guess that depends. The only end part that I remember is in the cave. Whether That's there's what I'm talking about. Okay. Yeah, that was fine, I guess. So I had issues with that. So so if you didn't, I mean maybe you might like Billy Seminoles too. I mean, everyone has different tastes. I I think I disliked the Outsiders ending so much because it felt like the same ending from Desperation. Like Okay, see I so haven't read Desperation. Desperation ends in a cave with like explosives and a monster being trapped, which is like this is the same fucking ending. <laughs> Well, see, now my thought was not that, I, and I haven't read it yet either. Yeah. But Monster in a Cave, my mind went to it. Yeah. Now, did you do, I can't remember if you did Desperation on Castle Rock Radio. I did. I think um, Betty Rocksteady was a guest on that one. Okay. Then I have, then everything I know about that is from that episode <laughs> of your podcast. Oh, no. <laughs> um, what I, um, I'm trying to think about that now. I loved Desperation as a kid, but when we revisited it for the uh, episode, I found myself kind of uh, groaning over the uh, the ultra, like how the excess uh, religious stuff in it. Like Stephen King usually has like some Christianity in his books, but usually it's not too too abundant but in desperation it's really much almost nothing but that and that kind of threw me off when i reread recently well i i actually just got a copy of it not too long ago yeah have not read it yet my i have the most tenuous of connections to that and regulators in that uh, you told me about this oh did i about the the cover artist? Yeah, that's right. Okay. You told me about this. I mean, you can tell the audience if you want. Well, well, I might have did it, done it in our first interview, so I would just that be might, rehashing. That might be how I know about this. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> uh, basically, uh, really quickly, there's a cover artist who happened to be local and in the phone book. I called him up one day, and he was, I believe, at that time working on the illustrations for the paperback covers for Desperation and Regulators. So, and if you want the full story, people, go and watch the, my first Max Booth interview, and hopefully that's where it is. <laughs> <laughs> Have you read the uh, the Regulators? No. I haven't in a long time. I want to revisit it, but I do vividly recall the beginning of that book, which is pretty extreme. It's like a, Sibil- uh, like a nice Sibilbia of... Uh, People delivering newspapers and ice cream, mowing the lawns. And this van just comes driving down, shooting like everyone with a shotgun. Like this child is just fucking blown away. Uh, as a kid, I thought this is pretty cool, but that's all I uh, recall about that book. I they desperation and regulators and a lot of other stuff fell into that period where I wasn't reading King. Yeah, which is essentially. After Misery. Okay. I tried a few, and again, I don't know if it was burnout or what it was, but I I started a few um, and just was not getting into them. And so with everything else there is to read, I just Uh let King pass me by for a while until um, Duma Key and Under the Dome. I read uh, I Know the Dome. I own Duma Key, but haven't read it yet. I, I have a difficult time reading him now because of that the podcast I did. I'm, it's just completely, <laughs> I'm just, I'm done with him, I think. I mean, I'm not done with him because I read Billy Semmelds. But I have a difficult time, like, giving a shit about reading his fiction when there's so many other, like, authors I've never read once. Like, I want to give these guys a try. So I'll Maybe get to his stuff eventually. When it becomes a job, that changes. Yeah. But um, yeah, so I've I've gotten back into it, like I said, into his stuff, and I, I liked the outsider. I liked the institute. Um, for me, the institute was a throwback to the older stuff, like uh, Firestarter. Okay, I, I like those two. Well, I like I like the kids with powers 
and yeah. evil government institutes kind of thing. So yeah, I was excited about that one about the institutes. So um, all right, well before we talk a little more a little bit more about what you're doing, do you have anything else you want to say about Evil Dead Two? Or any other questions about Evil Dead the musical? Do they did the did, what do they do with the hand? Do they cut it off? He does. Yeah. Um. I now again, our seats were way in the back. Yeah. So we didn't have the greatest. Not that it was a huge place. It was just a bunch of uh, bleachers in the woods when we saw it. But um, yeah, he cuts it off. That's one of the blood spraying scenes. Excellent. And ends up with the chainsaw. But again, this is like super, the one we saw anyway, super low budget where it's like when they're driving to the cabin in the woods, they're basically holding a cardboard cutout of a car. I'm you know? surprised they even have driving in that movie, in that musical. I, I would have assumed they would have just begun with them opening the cabin entrance and just coming in. That's surprising. No, you're the, it's, I have a Spotify work list with just, just tons and tons of different stuff on it. And I have songs from evil dead, the musical and the, the first song cabin in the woods is just so peppy and it's them <laughs> driving and you're basically meeting the characters. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so you have that. There was uh, at least again, in the production, we saw someone in a ghillie suit to represent the woods and stuff. Yeah. Which was great. Um, but yeah, it was just, it was so much fun and it was probably between like the level that we saw was probably between like high school production and professional community theater. Yeah. It sounds like a ton of fun. I I am envious. I'm going to definitely look up this music at some point today because I just I have to listen to it it just sounds I I knew a musical existed but I hadn't thought much about it beyond that I would love to see that I would also love to see the uh, the Beetlejuice musical that sounds awesome I'm not I'm not a big musical fan yeah but generally because old musicals the 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 music itself doesn't interest me right right but I love uh, I am a huge fan of Jesus Christ Superstar Mm mm-hmm but that's a rock opera, not oh, a musical. Excuse me. Um, but I actually, uh, we did a little performance of it at my church when I was growing up. Yeah. And I learned the entire thing. <laughs> so it stuck with me, and I love it. It's just great rock and roll. But but Evil Dead, the musical, I love the music in that. Reefer Madness, the musical. That's a great one. Absolutely love it. I have the soundtrack right here. <laughs> Which has both the movie soundtrack and the um, original Los Angeles cast recording. Oh, that's cool. So nice. it's got two on there. And I have the movie, which for some reason the case smells like chocolate. You know why that is. Yeah, well, I have theories. <laughs> um, but yeah, there are there are some newer musicals. Didn't Carrie get made into a musical? I think so. I don't know anything about it, but I think so. I, I've seen a few uh, musicals like Downtown, Go Downtown, Watch a Musical. Like I, I, uh, Some of the ones I, I quite enjoyed, the uh, Cabaret. Cabaret was awesome. The Book of, the Book of Millman is uh, just amazing. I am surprised they haven't made that into a movie yet because it would make a really funny movie. Um, Chicago's great. Um, uh, a movie I watched not that long ago for the first time, and I'm really surprised I waited so long, was um, Little Shop of Holds, the, the 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 plant musical with uh, Rick Moranis. It was amazing. I, I can't believe I waited so long. I am a huge fan of the original Roger Corman movie. Yes. Um, I grew up watching that. As a matter of fact, as a child. At one point, I was afraid to go outside in my bare feet <laughs> because I was afraid plants would eat me, yeah. eat my toes. Uh, but yeah, I enjoy the musical, the Rick Moranis. I haven't seen it live or anything, but yeah, the Not Rick Moranis right. movie's I've great. Watched, I've only seen the movie. I watched <laughs> the original movie and the musical back to back for the first time like a few months ago. It was a great night. I grew up with uh, West Side Story. Mm-hmm. That's my mother's favorite musical. Um, 
so I am I am partial to that, and I think that has some great songs in it. Plus, there's I mean, there's murder and stuff going on. So, oh yeah, I um I haven't seen that one. Um, I saw Rent, and that was I I expected that not to be good. I didn't know anything about it. I just. I just, you know, you, you sometimes when something is really popular, you think, OK, this is going to be dumb. But Rent was pretty good. Um, I had the same thought about Hamilton being dumb. And I, I was correct. <laughs> I did not like <laughs> Hamilton. I'm glad I did not see that live. I only saw like the movie that was released. And yeah, that means I'm not a fan of the music in that movie. Interesting. Musical. Well, it's uh, I, I want a musical of Cujo. That would be pretty uh, interesting. Or at the very least, I want a song sung by Cujo <laughs> about how he feels about having rabies. And I mean, it could be this this tragic song where he, he doesn't want to attack this woman and her child, yeah. but he can't help himself. It would be a great like Muppet, huh? Like Cujo the dog as a Muppet. And you could actually do it. Wow. All right. We need to go into production somehow. Uh, okay. Get Stephen King on the horn. You'd have like acoustic is when lamenting Cujo is singing. And then yeah. it goes into rock, hardcore yeah. guitar riffs when like the rabies <laughs> part of his brain takes over. And it's almost almost as if two people are singing the song. That would be pretty cool. I would like to see that. You should get that made. I mean, you have you have the resources to do this, right? You know Stephen King. Um, I know how to go and buy his books at the bookstore. Is that's that close? That's close enough. I don't know. As I mentioned, the I'm I'm almost done with this book right now, and I am convinced it would make a great musical. And God damn it, I'm gonna it's gonna happen somehow. I don't know who I call. Like, do I have to like contact the? the uh, musical organization and say hey count me in for one i, I don't know what to do but I'll, I'll figure it out it's gonna it's gonna be a musical well you've you've written short stories and novels and now yeah. a screenplay can you write music um i can write what they sing i cannot write what they play <laughs> Um, well, you do know a lot of authors, and I know quite a few authors seem to also be musicians. You need to hook up with one of them. All right, I will. I will do this. Now, I you... don't think it should be. I don't think it should be like when I say musical. I'm not talking about like oh, it's going to be on stage. Maybe one day. I just want to make a movie, a musical movie that is of this book, because I mean, just to spoil a bit. I would love to see a line of claymation maggots with top hats and canes doing a, a, a song, and that would be relevant in this movie adaptation. I think it could happen. Well, I want to see that now. <laughs> Lots of things rhyme with decompose and rot. <laughs> I think they do. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, all right. Well, so what are you working on now? You've got. Um... Maggots screaming? Uh, that's the one, yeah. Um, uh, hopefully one day I'll be done with that soon. But that's the one I'm. Uh, that's the one I'm writing right now. And then you're still doing, obviously, Ghoulish. I am, yeah. There's a podcast. Uh, maybe you know it. It's called Ghoulish. I, I host it. It's. It comes out sometimes twice a week, sometimes once a week, depending on how much free time I have to uh, edit episodes because that takes a long time. So like if you look at the run time of an episode and then if you just like times that by two or three, that's how long it takes me to edit one. So sometimes they uh, don't come out at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do. I love ghoulish. Um, and I think if, if the S.A. Cosby episode is any indication your editing skills are fantastic thank you that was um, uh that was the most painful one to, to edit i think oh my god i still can't believe i, I survived <laughs> all right i had uh, a, i had a with that one i actually had to delete audio and just re-say it while editing and just 
make it make sense with the rest of the audio just because what I would say would be just completely lost or it wouldn't make any sense compared to what he was saying just due to the, the odd internet delay we were experiencing. So for the for the film savvy, you were doing ADR work. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Look at you knowing film uh, vocab. Well, I, see. I watch all those special features on my movies. <laughs> uh, all right. Anything else you want to tell people or talk about before we wrap this up? Um, I, re- I recently launched a new news level called uh, The Ghoulish Times. And I guess you would find it by going to theghoulishtimes.substack.com. Also, if you go to www.pmmpnews.com, I think it, it's going to redirect you to the Substack page now. So I'm doing that once a week. Uh, it's a, essentially a reboot of the infrequent newsletter I used to send out. I'm trying to do this every Saturday morning in addition to like news of the week of the stuff I'm, I'm publishing and putting out. I'm also trying to do like a mini essay about something spooky. So it gives you more incentive to uh, read it and hopefully buy books we put out. So go subscribe to that. Yeah, I read it yesterday morning, I believe it was. And uh, the the second one. Yeah. Um, read the first one last week. But yeah, very interesting. I like that you're adding that little bit of not just here's what's going on, but here's a subject that's interesting yeah. and lots of links in there i uh, have no idea how long that will last <laughs> I, I hope i can continue doing that once a week it uh it took up a lot of time surprisingly i did not expect it to take up like a whole it was just that was just the that day that's all i did <laughs> well i've enjoyed i've enjoyed the two issues so far but i enjoyed the uh the previous iteration of it yeah that one was pretty uh it had no rhyme or rhythm to it. Sometimes I would send one out like every three weeks. Sometimes I would send three out in one week. <laughs> it was chaos. <laughs> you do what you gotta do. Oh, I'm also discovering like the old host was Mailchimp, and now I'm doing Substack, and I'm getting uh, an increase in email opens compiled to Mailchimp. So now I'm convinced Mailchimp was like sending most of these fucking things to spam. Because I'm getting so much null activity with Substack. Now, did you make the switch based on Brian Keene talking about making the switch? Yeah, because I asked him. I said, well, why are you doing this? And he said, because I'm sick of paying 50 bucks a month. And I thought, I'm also paying 50 bucks a <laughs> month. And I don't have that kind of money. <laughs> so that's why I did it. Yeah, and I'm so glad I did. It's such an improvement of MailChimp. Well, that's great. Yeah. Um, and now I've got two newsletters to look forward to on the weekend i got yours on saturday brian's on sunday i should put mine out on sunday too and (laughs) blow him out of competition um for those who have stuck with the ghoulish podcast since the beginning episode one brian keen was on and i told him that my goal was to eventually uh outlast his podcast and i fucking did that by the way he is done and i am reigning supreme he is done, and you are reigning supreme, but if we compare numbers, like the number of episodes... Let's compare quality and not quantity. Oh, okay. <laughs> I am winning. There you go. <laughs> All right, where can people find you online, or where would where do you, if you want people to find you online? I think, honestly, just um, subscribe to the newsletter. Yeah, the ghoulish times dot sub step. P- pmmpnews.com that's way easier to say pmmpnews.com that should be a good link now if you just go to uh pmmppublishing.com or whatever the that website is will that have a link as well it, yeah it, it yeah the publishing company's uh website is perpetualpublishing.com and i believe we added a link to the news level on the home page but if not i'm going too soon i uh, i only have so much time in a day <laughs> oh, yeah. all right well if you can stick around for a couple minutes after i wrap this up which i'm gonna do right now thank you very much max booth the third for being here 
Uh, folks, if you have any comments or questions, put them in the comments below. Uh, please like, share, and subscribe. I think I've covered everything. So uh, thanks again to Max. I have been Eric. And until next time, folks, read more books.